Welcome to another Journey to the Blue Sky. My name is Aaron. My name is Patricia. And today we are looking at the movie Rio 2, the sequel to the movie Rio. And uh, I mean, I- I've just, we've I've literally just come off watching it. And uh, I've got to be honest with everybody. Um, I mean, I'm starting to kind of see the argument of why Rio probably should have just been like a once and never again kind of situation, in my mm. opinion. Yeah, like I literally just finished watching the movie and I I cannot even tell you in full detail on what it's even about because there's just so much going on, but at the same time, it's pretty forgettable. Yeah, so Rio 2 is a 2014 American 3D computer animated musical comedy film produced by Blue Sky Studios and directed by Carlos uh, Saladana. Uh, it is a sequel to the 2011 uh, computer animated film Rio and the second installment of the Rio franchise. So three years after the events of the first film, uh, Blue and Jewel are raising their three children, Carla, Bia, and Diego, uh, in the city, uh, but Jewel is disappointed to see that her children are becoming too domesticated like their father. Meanwhile, Linda and Tulio are in an expedition in the Amazon, and after the fall down of a tr- uh, falling down a waterfall, uh, discover a blue spring macaw uh, that uh, loses that loses one of its feathers. When words get around the in- get word comes around about the encounter that are broadcast through the television, Jewel believes that they should go to the Amazon to help find the blue macaws. While the kids are ecstatic, Blue is uncertain as he is pressured into going along. Uh, Raviel, Nico, and Pedro also decide to come along uh, to scout the talent for the carnival. Uh, Louis tries to follow, but is unknowingly to him, he's left behind the birds, and uh, Blue brings a fanny pack full of surprise with a GPS, uh, much to Jewel's chagrin. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, I mean, right off the bat, like, you know, um, we've got a bit of a problem here because there is far too much going on in this movie. You've got, um, one with Blue going off to the Amazon and realizing that he's not really all that welcome there and doesn't feel all that comfortable being there. You've uh, got Jewel, who is basically discovering her family for the first time. And, uh, you know, and then there's all this kind of like, you know, backstory that really should have been probably explored a lot more, but just really isn't. And and then you've got like the three kids, and I've got to be honest. Until like I read my notes, I actually forgot their names. The fact that they're Carla Beer and Diego, I, I had no yeah, idea. Yeah, I, I forgot what their. They were. I forgot the names of all the new characters. Like they barely mentioned them, and they also have like one no personalities. One's the smart one. One's the rambunctious one, and one is just the diva who just loves dancing and singing. I yeah. I, I literally don't remember any of them. They're like a poorly written version of the Chipettes effectively <laughs> like yeah, that's the only way i could really probably describe them and i don't know how to describe this to anybody who has not watched the movie by the way if you have not watched the movie please go or well, i mean i don't know if you want to go watch it and then come back to us but uh, there are gonna be spoilers and well, there's always spoilers basically in journeys to the blue skies yeah but uh and i i don't know how to describe this to everybody but somehow nigel has survived and is now basically doing the team rocket rule apparently yeah exactly and, just uh, trying to get revenge on blue for everything that happened in the first movie it's like Why is he even here? Why is Nigel alive? I was surprised to even see him here because we have another villain who's mixed up in this movie called Big Boss. And no, I'm not talking about Big Boss. I'm so yeah, my Metal Gear Solid. Solid, Yeah, Um, I'm not talking about that Big Boss, even though that would be awesome in here. I mean, especially since it does take place in the. It made the movie more interesting, wouldn't it? Yeah, and I, yeah, it, it was kind of like in Metal Gear Solid 3 in which Big Boss or Naked Snake is in the jungle, but I know this is the Russian jungle in that game, but I digress. But yeah, he's just a logger. Well, in the first movie, you had a poacher. So yeah, it's it's like a complete step down in terms of everything. Like the villain is not as good. The story is all over the place, but not anywhere near as memorable. The music is much more apparent here, but again, pretty forgettable. All the new characters that are added into this movie, completely forgettable. And yeah, just everything about this movie is just like so mediocre. Like I I, I literally 
do not remember anything on this. And they try to make this like a big movie, like everything about it, the stakes are higher, especially with Blue, where he's trying to decide on whether he should be with his family in the Amazon or whether he should go back to the sanctuary and then... You have this whole thing involving with the macaws wanting nothing to do with Blue because he's too domesticated and he likes humans and they hate humans. And yeah, there's just too much happening and there's just not a lot of development with the things that should be important. Like, I don't know, like the backstory on Jewel. I mean, we literally just found out from the first movie that, yeah, she was captured and then she was placed in the sanctuary because they're waiting for the another macaw so that they can be able to breed. Because, hey, remember in the first movie when a major stake on these macaws is that they were the only ones left? Well, apparently, according to this movie, there's a whole bunch of them. Yeah, and I tell you what, this movie, this basically, I mean, the way that this movie feels right now, and we barely got well, how many? What we're like, what four minutes into this review, something yeah. like that. Like, I mean, like uh, this movie, I can describe in two ways: uh, painfully average and very, very dated. As of this podcast, blue macaws are currently extinct in the wild. There are no like blue macaws apparently left, according to researchers. Yes, exactly, so, and yeah. there's only like maybe over 50 in captivity so yeah this movie is very uncomfortable to look at by today's standards especially yeah, and if you and also are logging a... is still going on in the amazon as we speak so yeah. like uh, this movie's not done anything to address that either so, yeah, uh, and, yeah and you would think that this movie would kind of like help bring awareness to people it's like hey you know this is all the stuff that's happening in the amazon we have loggers who are chopping down trees illegally and getting rid of the homes of many creatures and hey you know there's these uh macaws who are the last of their kind and we need to protect them but apparently it did absolutely nothing yeah there's just nothing really to kind of like take away from this film you know where when you when you watch it like uh, there was just times where like uh, i was one time i actually had to pause the movie to kind of like you know take a bit of a break and then after that i went back to it again that's not a good sign no i, I had to do the same thing too i was like maybe halfway done with the movie and then i was like is i mean you have all of these plot points going on you have one moment in which uh, they decide that they're going to go to the amazon and then you have another moment in which you have those um uh, those two birds uh, who are voiced by Will I Am and Jamie Foxx, who are doing this audition for the Carnival, and then you have Nigel plotting his revenge alongside with a poisonous frog and an ant um, ant eater, and then you have this other plot point with these loggers who are trying to chop down trees, and then you have this other plot point involving with Linda and Tulio from the first movie, who are trying to uh, find out where the remaining macaw are because they were able to find that feather, and yeah, there's just so much going on in this movie. It's 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 like the crude uh, mentality all over again in which we just have to throw in so many plot points but with not enough focus you know what i, I remember seeing like those audition like you know uh, things and i just thought you know what this thing's warning us about sing is on the way like that'll be coming out two years later well i mean that, that that's the illumination that has nothing to do with blue i Sky. know exactly but it kind of made me feel like oh this thing's trying to warn us about something and then we realized like you know exactly you know then we got the trailer for sing and it's like oh yeah it's just doing that from rio too <laughs> oh my god like uh, yeah, it's just it's uh... so. I mean, also on top of that as well, like all the all the characters in this movie, they're pretty stuck, aren't they? Like you know, you've got uh, Jesse Eisenberg as Blue, who's like you know this real you know basically just thrown into an uncomfortable situation. Like we're not seen that a thousand times before. Like you know, throughout the eighties to the nineties and like two thousand. Like, uh, yeah, just, I mean, I would, I, yeah, and, and I understand, you know, he's domesticated. We knew that from the first movie that he had never been raised in the wild. We get that part. And from, from the first movie, we learned about how when he was a young bird, he was, uh, you know, taken in by poachers. And then eventually he was sold as a pet. And then eventually... Uh, because of meeting up with Jewel, he was able to learn how to fly and he was able to become a wild bird as opposed to being just a pet. And now in this movie, now that they have kids, they're still sticking to that domesticated life because they live in the sanctuary and they're able to use conventional means that humans have. And now that he's in the wild with no um, opportunities for him to use any human products, especially since they're banned because uh, the main leader of the macaws who's Jules' father whom uh, his name is eduardo and literally i had to just, just look it up my nose because i completely forgot what his uh, name yeah, is yeah i just know him as like you know the dad effectively or papa or whatever like, yeah you pop, know, like, pop, yeah. Uh, yeah yeah so he doesn't want any human 
items in this uh, neck of the uh, forest because, well, anything with humans is bad. And, of course, it makes a lot of sense. You know something? The only thing that disappoints me, when we first saw this character, I really thought, oh, yeah, this is going to be, like, you know, the hard-headed, like, you know, dad character who, like, you know, is brought up, like, in his own ways. And, uh, you know, he's like, oh, humans are evil. Ah, like, you know, we got to protect the forest and, like, all the, all the threats and everything like that. Like, he becomes, you know, that kind of thing. And, like, it, it takes, you know, Blue to, like, you know, make him come out of his shell and, like, see another point of view and stuff like that and uh, unfortunately that's what we get but uh, I really thought at the very beginning like you know when he was like offering to like you know give Blue a hug I thought you know oh hey he's going to be like you know the uh, the wise old saint who you know uh, knows about things that are going on I really thought we were going to get like a different character but no generic <sighs> that's all I gotta say yeah, no. and I would I would have loved to have seen maybe like a backstory about like him trying to search for Jewel all this time when they were separated from the loggers or maybe when he was mentioning earlier about like, you know, humans pushed us further and further and further away into this place that we're at now. Like we could have seen like a much more justified reason on why he hates humans other than just that throwaway line he mentioned earlier. But no, of, of course not. And and there was even a moment with um that other like bird, uh, what was his name, Roberto, uh, who is afraid of humans because you know he was captured by them and he was made as like uh, a parrot. So again, there's stuff there, but unfortunately, it's just one moment and then that's pretty much it. It's it's so weak. Like there's an opportunity for you to showcase on the post-traumatic stress disorder that birds have to go through in order for them to hide away from humans so that they can be able to live normal lives. And this will give the opportunity to show that, you know, humans have done all of this stuff to birds, but again, it's just so one note. And then the human side is just so one note. It's like, okay, you have big boss who's chopping down logs. Okay. Is he, is he going to sell it? Is he going to make something out of it? Just, he's just doing this because when he saw that Linda and Tulio were in the area protecting the birds, he was calling them tree huggers. So it's that he hates tree huggers and he just wants them to go away so that he could chop logs for whatever reason. Yeah. Like, well, I can understand like, you know, deforestation because obviously like there's this whole thing about palm oil about like, you know, obviously people are chopping down trees and all it's like, you know, plant palm oil and all over the place. So like, you know, if he was doing that, obviously that would also play into the, you know, more into the narrative, which I think we're probably, they should have done. Really. Yeah, but, but there's literally there's like, no reason. There's no motivation with this villain that we're supposed yeah, that we're following. He, he's basically got the same motivation as the mayor from Action League now, effectively. Like you know, I, I just do things because I'm evil. You know, like uh, <laughs> it's just yeah, it's just it's uh, the, 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 they could have easily written something far more. In fact, the, the problem is that I mean, Big Boss doesn't get much time to sort of like get an explanation for himself because unfortunately we're stuck with Nigel, who oh, like yeah, you know that, is yeah, the comic exactly. relief villain. Yeah, like we have two villains in this movie and none of them get any side, uh, any form of development other than Nigel. But then again, the reason why was because we saw him in the first movie. Yeah, he didn't need to be in this movie. No, like, he was completely worthless. He should have been dead and we would have focused more on this logger. But again, you know, this logger was very underdeveloped. So maybe they pro maybe the reason why they included Nigel back in the movie is because this logger was just so bland that they think that they 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 didn't think they probably could have carried the whole movie. Well, yeah, they should have made they should have made it more interesting. They should have rewritten him. Like, you know, it's just, a, or maybe they could have, like, N Nigel back, but then now he's like, here's the thing, the, 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 the thing with Nigel is that, you know, I said from, the, you know, I remember in that last review, I said, um, they should have made Nigel, like, you know, the main, and you know, villain of the movie, like, he's controlling everything, like, you know, even he can control humans. You know, like, uh, they should have made him sort of that kind of villain. But, uh, you know, and then when he came back for this movie, you know, him controlling the tree locker would have been more plausible because then they wouldn't have to write a character for him. Nigel's just a puppet master who's controlling everything that's going on. And or, or maybe that it. Nigel and the tree loggers could have, like, teamed up together. I don't know. Like, maybe bring a reason on why they're trying to, you know, have a justification on why there's two villains in this movie. Like, at least with the first movie, it made a lot of sense why there were technically two villains. You had the poacher and you had Nigel. And it made a lot of sense because Nigel was with the poacher and that was his companion. And this one is just like, they're completely separate. Like, I, I just wish yeah. there would have been a justified reason on why we're going to have these two villains in this movie. Essentially... One of them is trying to get rid of um, the trees and the other one's trying to get revenge on Blue for all the events that happened in the first movie. Yeah. 
So uh, in the middle of all this, uh, there is like a some kind of like bird soccer game that basically happens. Oh, yeah, that's right. Some, so basically, you know, the reason uh, yeah. why and by the way, because... the, this this storyline gets barely any explanation as well. Like, you know, why the bloom of course and why the red birds aren't like, you know, are at each other's throats as well. Okay, like the Scarlet Macaws. The reason the why Scarlet is Macaws. because um, the blue macaws have one side of the forest where they have their Brazil nuts. And then the Scarlet Macaws have their side where they have their Brazil nuts. And blue wandered into the Scarlet Macaws cause side because he was looking to get a brazil but what's for the what, for what's breakfast. the origin of all of this why are they've got this why have they got this agreement like you know like uh, that that needs explaining too in my opinion and yeah it doesn't I, get, yeah exactly and again I, it doesn't get explained no you know? and, and i know that in the animal kingdom that there are sections of forest or land that certain animals don't come across because you know they'll get violent and then they'll call upon um you know their group of animals to defend it and yeah it, it does make a lot of sense on that part but story wise why are they separated like yeah. was did something happen to them that caused them to separate or I, I, again i don't know why it, what was it with the with the with the uh, with the scarlet McCall's prevented from marrying their cousins is that like you know that's the reason why shelbyville exists in the simpsons <laughs> you know like i i don't know but uh, i was making stuff up like you know this is the thing there's no there's no imagination in this movie is there besides the fact that we're in brazil like it's just it's uh, th there's nothing you know that Makes me feel like, oh, hey, this is an imaginative bit. Oh, this is a really good, cool bit. No, it's just kind of like, uh, you know, whatever they could find, which is pretty generic and pretty average, and they stuck it all in this movie and just hope it would be entertaining. And, you know, the whole soccer thing, I felt like, you know, after I turned like turned it off like for the first half, and then I went off and did something else for a little while, and then I came back and turned it back on, I was that, I was, right, moments later, I was at that, that segment, and I thought, is this movie listening to me and pandering to me? Somehow, does it realize I'm getting bored with it? And like, you know, it's now trying to like put football in front of me. By the way, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a massive football fan, by the way, for those of you who do not know. But I mean, that, that's gonna, it just felt, it, it didn't really feel like all that great. It kind of felt eerie in a way when I saw that. Like, it realized how bored I was getting with this movie and he decided to put this in front of me to try and keep me entertained. Yeah. Um, and you would think that something called the Pit of Doom would have been like, I don't know, fighting, but no, it's soccer. <laughs> yeah because brazil loves soccer <laughs> yeah exactly that's what i'm saying like you know it's again it's almost like ai wrote this movie in a way when you really think about it like it took all the elements from like the first movie and then put them in the second movie and did them even worse uh, and then you have um I'm, I'm you know what i just need to just speak about the fact that both eduardo and roberto are trying to push blue away so far from their group because he's not considered a bird it's like bro he saved your daughter. He brought them there 2,000 miles away from Rio de Janeiro to the Amazon. And he's just as part of the family as anything else. I mean, you have grandkids and, you know, your daughter clearly loves him and he's willing to, you know, uh, break away from his comfort zone so that he can be able to travel over there. Just show some respect, man. Come on. <laughs> Yeah, you're going to give credit to Blue. Like, he's gone all this way to, like, you know, try and please his family. And Jewel barely gives him, well, you know, says, oh, you're not being, like, you know, being accepting enough. Like, I'm sorry, but that's just really... Yeah, that just that just rubs me the wrong way now that I think about it. Yeah, and then Jewel basically says to Blue, it's like, you're being selfish, and why can't you think more about uh, us as opposed to yourself? It's like, what the hell are you talking, talking about? Talking about, yeah, like, you know, he's taking his whole family out of his comfort zone and brought them into a place where he doesn't even know whether they're actually going to be safe or not. If anything, yeah, if anything, think. Blue is the one who's been sacrificing so much. He left his, you know, essentially his um, owner for uh, he was raised for his, his entire life so that he can be able to live amongst, um, you know, the sanctuary. And then finally, he's out of the sanctuary and out in the middle of nowhere with no human civilization, no products, no anything like that. And everybody's just making fun of him, saying, oh, you're too domesticated. You're not a bird you're just a pet and he has to put up with all of that nonsense just for his family i say the, that blue by the is way. a fantastic character who sacrificed so much and gets the short end of the stick every single time yeah oh by the way um as so speaking of characters um so you know fernando who like you know was a big part of like the first movie he just gets a cameo in this 
yeah effectively yeah and, and that's, a, that's a massive disappointment i mean fernando was a kid who was working alongside with the poachers because he was trying to make ends meet because he was an orphan and then eventually he gets adopted by tulio and by linda and you would think that maybe he would get a little bit more development maybe he would be able to be alongside with them i mean he's not even in this movie as much he's only there for just barely the beginning and, you know, we just see him there and then that's like, that's it. It's like, really? A, a character who went through a lot in the first movie is just going to get a cameo in the second movie? Yeah, if anything, Nigel should have had the cameo. And, uh, you know, if anything, Fernando should probably have, like, you know, more of a role in the movie. In fact, maybe, yeah. he maybe he should have got a gun with him to the Amazon. You know, like, yeah. when he found and, out and that his also it just really trouble. pisses me off that Linda is so much more capable of protecting herself in the jungle than Tulio. Isn't Linda the one from Minnesota and who has is basically breaking away from her comfort zone while Tulio's the one who lived there all his life and studying birds and probably going around and, you know, trying to research them. And he's the one who's failing at everything. Yeah, like, like there, there are some serious but, issues. Everything is just so backwards. Also, I mean, I, I, I don't really want to kind of like, but this is like it's just a tidbit, really. I don't really want to bring this, like you know, as a, give this too much attention. But I get a feeling there's like a little bit of like an American exceptionalism in this movie. Like, you know, do you hear like when Rio like gets like sorry when uh, sorry not Rio when Blue like you know gets dragged you know uh, uh, you know away from everybody and like looks like he's getting kidnapped by another bird and uh, then like he says you know I'm a U.S. citizen I shouldn't be treated like this blah 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 it's like dude. Like, like, no, it's like, you know, and then all of a sudden, like, you know, Linda is the one apparently who's like, you know, the stronger one compared to Tulio, like compared to the the Brazilian, you know, uh, you know, scientist who like has spent his the whole life, you know, uh, researching all this stuff. And then Linda somehow ends up being kind of like the more powerful character, like, you know, in the space of like three years. Yeah, that doesn't make like, any sense. Yeah, like it's just it's uh, I'm sorry, you know, like uh, if anything, Linda should just be like, you know, like, oh, we don't do fighting tree loggers in Minnesota. You know, like, you know, just, just... Yeah, exactly. She's been in Rio de Janeiro in a bird sanctuary for three years, and I'm sure that this will probably be her very first time ever in a jungle. Spoiler alert, there but, are no jungles in the Minnesota. Only, the only thing I could think of is that obviously they fan serviced her in like in the in the first movie, so maybe this is the making up for it in the fact that you know she's not eye candy, basically. She, she can't hold her own, maybe. Like, you know, I, I don't know. That's the only thing I could think of, really. Yeah, and they try to make her not like did. you know, oh, you know, she's no longer um, you know, the the one one who's outside of her comfort zone because she's already been there for a few years. So let's see if we can make her stronger. But you made her a little too strong. <laughs> I know exactly. And so um, I don't know. It's just it's uh, it's yeah, it's strange. That's all it I is, can it say. It is very strange. And then you have the climax of the movie where you have, you know, both Nigel and the loggers trying to, like, t take their um, motivations to the extreme. And it's just so disappointing. Uh, well, it's just it, it's the problem is it sends sort of the wrong message when you think about it. Like, it's kind of like, uh, oh, hey, don't worry, everybody. The animals will save themselves from the loggers. It's like, no. No, like, I, I get, I get, it's an animated movie, but like, come on, like it's just, it's a, you know, it, it already aged terribly already. This is just like the icing on the cake uh, for all yeah, of that. At yeah. least, in, I mean, I would make the argument for Once Upon a Forest that when they were captured by the, um, you know, the the humans in the forest when they were trying to clean up the gas that affected everything. They didn't try to, like, fight off against them. They were scared. They were frightened. And they didn't know what to do. And then eventually they were set free because that wasn't their um, motivation. They didn't want to capture the animals. They just wanted to clean up the mess that they caused. It's like, that's more realistic. You're trying to tell me that a movie that came out almost 30 years ago was much more realistic than a movie that just came out more than 10 what it probably would have been better, in, in my opinion, would have been that uh, they, you know, you had... Um... Um, yeah, Tulio, you had uh, Linda and you had Fernando and somehow like, you know, they came up with some kind of like, you know, somehow some kind of schemes to like, you know, stop the loggers from doing what they're doing. And so then eventually, like, you know, more people will get involved and they will protect the animals. And then when they get attacked, like, you know, by the more, you know, I would say supernatural, like parts of like, you know, the movie, then obviously the animals will get involved and then there'll be a big massive fight. That would probably be a better way of doing it, in my opinion. But Yeah. And then you, there's this, there's a little bit of tension that happens toward the end of the movie where, um, the poison frog, the um, the the porcupine needle was stabbed, and you would think that, oh wow, you know, she's a poison frog. This character is going to die, but then it turned out there was a plot twist. She's not a poison frog, and I'm like, oh come on, come on. that would have been really interesting to see a character almost die. 
Yeah, exactly. And uh, it would have been it would be more also uh, dramatic if it, you know, mind you, the the whole thing like Nigel, I think, was introduced far too far too late in my opinion, like, you know, that, that whole, that whole scene, like, uh, so for me, like, uh, yeah, it just, if it, it would have been more interesting if, you know, Blue had known of Nigel, maybe, uh, you know, boy later on in the movie and then somehow he turned up, but I mean, obviously they, they didn't, they didn't give us that in the boat scene, you know, they just basically just said, oh, they just, you know, uh, blew the horn and then they just blew, they all went, flew away and then, you know, uh, the, the, the McCalls were none the wiser. Yeah, yeah, and there was also another scene where, um, for some reason, Nigel wanted to audition for the Carnival, and he was, like, literally right there where Blue was, and you, we even he saw- He walked right past him! Yeah, he, he walked right past him, and even um, the poisonous frog was like, hey, hey, turn around, look behind you, there's the bird that you're looking for to kill, and he is just so in cloud nine because he did so well with this audition that he didn't even see him. yeah. Like, it's just this, oh, again, I, I mean, I guess it's part of his character, but again, it's a poorly written character. So, I mean, that's not really giving any points to anything. No. So, yeah. Oh, boy. You know, just, um, also, the music's pretty stock as well. Oh, by the way, um, Nigel sings like a, like a, like a um, Carnival kind of like style of I Will Survive from, uh, you know, uh, that that song. Which yes, yeah, he must have been singing. He must have been singing hot, hot stuff, stuff or the birdie song or something like that. Like, you yeah, know, he he mixed a bit of uh, "I Will Survive" and "Eye of the Tiger" and various other songs. It's yeah, it, it's pretty just stock. I mean, I, I I I this is why a lot of people complain whenever animated movies do jukebox musicals because they think it's just so lazy. It's like, why can't you just write your own original songs? Well, they do in this movie and it's just as bad. So it's like Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, here's the thing. It can e- it could work either way. Like jukebox musicals can work if done right. Original music can work if done right. This is an example in which it's done wrong both ways, which is not very good. No, totally not. And um, I mean, the only thing I could always give credit points to always the animation. Like, you know, the animation. Yeah, I boring. mean, once again, they do great animation. I mean, everything about Rio de Janeiro was great in the beginning. Everything about the Amazon forest was great uh, when we got there and the birds flying and the the colors. I mean, once again, that's what we're praising Blue Sky for. They have great animation. But like we've been mentioning almost every single time, Stories, characters, songs, everything else is just secondary. I've got to be honest with everybody. I mean, like, besides what we've just described, I mean, there's nothing very much else there is. Do you know know what's ironic about this movie? It does so much, but then has so little to talk about afterwards. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it, it, it literally just has a lot more going on. There's a lot more characters introduced. There's a lot more plot points that are brought in. But at the same time, when you finish watching this movie, you're not going to remember any of it. You just feel unfulfilled after watching this movie. And also, I, I felt disappointed. Goes- I felt really disappointed because the first Rio movie, even though that it wasn't fantastic, it, it it was pretty, you know, it was pretty solid. I mean, you have this bird who lived in a, a domesticated life all his life. Then he finds out that it turns out that there was another one of his kind who's much more wild. And then they have this really nice love story. You get to explore more of Rio de Janeiro. I mean, it had potential and it had a lot of possibilities to expand more of the story, expand more of Blue's story, expand more of Linda's story. But unfortunately, when it came to the sequel, it it just leaves so much out that it just makes you feel unfulfilled. Yeah. So uh, this movie um, grossed about um, it was about four hundred uh, four hundred million dollars at the box office compared to its one hundred and thirty million dollar budget. So yeah. uh, it wasn't as successful as like the first movie. From not from even not I even close. In yeah, fact, I, well, I, actually, I, I say no, I lie. I say it's, it's made uh, three hundred ninety nine million uh, nine hundred thousand uh, dollars. I should say because they do, they donated one hundred thousand dollars to the WWF for charity. So. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, that that's that's nice. That's so that's really even, nice. <laughs> so it made even less than that. But, uh, it just, yeah. It, but it, yeah, and and it, and it was like it, sure it was in the top three of the highest grossing animated films of 2014. But look at all the movies that came out around that time: Big Hero Six, The Lego Movie, uh, How to Train Your Dragon Two. So yeah, it had some stiff competition at the time. Yeah, that, that's true. But at the same time, like, you know, this movie on its own, like, you know, I would like to say that Rio 2 was just the victim of circumstance. But unfortunately, you know, given the, how much better thing movies were around that time, unfortunately, I think Rio 2 kind of got what it deserved. 
really yeah it's true i mean everybody remembers the lego movie about you know all the stuff that it was able to bring in i mean that was the movie that pretty much revolutionized in terms of the kind of movies that we would even have today like unique animation a funny story memorable songs social commentary a lot of people remember all the i mean and there was so much competition of you know what was going to be the next lego movie we're going to have okay we're going to have a movie about this toy and this toy but don't even uh, under Understand on why that movie was so great in the first place and once again the movie was written and directed by lord and miller which i always constantly say those guys know how to take a concept that sounds absolutely awful and turn it into gold yeah and then you, and have- you, know, and you know who tries to hor- horribly copy that uh, that whole aesthetic of the lego movie oh who's that the lorax of course they did. Yeah. And then, of course, there's How to Train Your Dragon 2, which is an amazing movie. You see, this is an example on how to take a movie that was solid and make it even better. How to Train Your Dragon 2 is one of the best sequels of an animated movie ever made. And then, of course, there's Big Hero 6, which is also a fantastic movie. And it was able to spin off into an animated series. And as of the recording of this podcast, they just announced that they're going to be having a section of San Fran, Tokyo in Disney World. So, yeah, that's still pretty relevant in today's uh, minds for people. But, uh, yeah, as for Rio 2, yeah, nobody remembers it. And for good reason. Yeah. All right, everybody. So uh, I guess we're going to go uh, through um, this and uh, see what uh, score we went we ended up with. And uh, but uh, to be honest with everybody, like you know, uh, there is nothing you know groundbreaking about this movie. It is a sequel to you know um, another movie that uh, you know even I was kind of questioning you know uh, some bits and pieces of. And uh, you know we basically got generic characters a generic story a uh, you know basically it's just it's just full of celebrities basically just doing voices and uh, the music also nothing with that and also an unnecessary return of a villain and uh, you know even if they even even if they could make him necessary they did him completely wrong and uh, also a generic villain you know everything's just generic in this movie and very dated and also is not aged well i'm going to say 4 I'm going to say five. And the reason why is because it's not egregious. It's not like downright abysmal, but with Epic, for example, the reason why I felt that that movie was just so, so bad was because it took a concept that was already established like decades ago and did absolutely nothing to it. And they essentially took a, a simple quaint children's book and decided to throw action moments because they wanted to make it more exciting for the kids, which is a major slap in the face of the attention span and the intelligence of children. Well, this one is just a mediocre sequel. I mean, I'm even though that I gave the first movie, I think a seven, this one is definitely a step down in terms of everything, but it's not downright awful i still think epic is worse so i'm gonna give it a five okay so 4.5 out of 10 effectively that sounds about right yeah yeah all right everybody well that's our latest uh journey to the blue sky and so well, what do we got coming up next babe all right so coming up next we're going to be talking about what many people consider to be the magnum opus of blue sky studios we're going to be talking about the peanuts movie okay until then uh bye-bye for now see ya <laughs>